Hi, everybody. My name is Kate Edwards. I'm the executive director of the Global Game Jam organization. I'm also a consultant and a geographer who's been doing culturalization work in the game industry for over 27 years. Um, but what I'm here to talk about is a really important topic. It's important to me and it's important to a lot of people I know in the industry. And that's about how mental health affects our ability to create games. And the reason I'm talking on this is because not only am I a board member on the organization called Take This, which deals with mental health in the game industry, I'm also a patron of the organization called Safe in Our World out of the UK, which also focuses on mental health in the game industry. But this is a topic that's really important to me because I know so many people in the game industry who have dealt with this issue and continue to deal with this issue. And it kind of is a, a strong, you know, a, a thing that affects a lot of us in this industry. And yet many people don't want to talk about it. So I'm going to talk about it. So um, just to carry on here, um, switching over to my slides. So let's just get started with this. So, um, you know, when we hear a lot of stories that happen in the game industry, we, we see these all the time. We see it in the games media and in other media about problems in our industry with different studios. And, you know, I get a lot of messages from people, especially students and young people who want to get into this industry, and they see these stories and it really scares them. And they wonder if this is what my life is going to be like if I go into the game industry. Is this the kind of atmosphere I'm going to have to endure where I'm working 100 hour weeks in order to, you know, basically do my passion? Um, you know, or, or am I going to have to deal with my company not backing me up when I when a problem happens? Like if you're a community manager and you're, you're talking with the community on a regular basis. Um, you know, these, these consequences and these decisions by companies have a lot of huge impact on the industry and it has an impact on people's perception about whether or not they want to work in this industry or whether or not they want to actually stay in this industry. And so these stories are very prevalent. We've seen them a lot, as I mentioned before. Um, unfortunately, they continue to happen. Um, and so basically, one of the messages that I get a lot from, from people is, is this message. This was actually a quote from a message I got from a student based in the Netherlands um, as about a year ago. And what she was expressing is that right now, I'm mainly afraid of what future awaits me. And that kind of sentiment after her seeing these stories and considering what her, both her physical and mental health would be like after working in the game industry, that made her very concerned. Obviously, she's very passionate about making games, as many of us are, but at what cost? And, and that's what I'm going to talk about a bit. So this talk comes from my experience in, in this industry. Again, I've been in this industry a very long time, over 27 years. And in my role as executive director of the International Game Developers Association, and also in my role as running the Global Game Jam, I'm in a unique position to talk to developers all over the world, pretty much anywhere you can imagine. And I've traveled all over the place. Of course, with the pandemic, I'm not traveling at all right now. But I've been able to talk to developers from basically any kind of background you can imagine. And one of the most common themes I hear all the time is the concern about mental health and what that means to their career and what it means to their ability to create games. And so um, that concern about mental health is something I want to address because, again, it's something that we often don't talk about uh, within our industry. So the, the not be, maybe not surprising is that one in five people will be diagnosed every year with some kind of mental health condition uh, or whatever that might be. And one in two people will be diagnosed in their entire lifetime. So basically 50% of the population at will at some point in their life deal with some kind of mental health issue. And so when we're, when we're dealing with this in the game industry, that we found that there's three key factors that are affecting game developer uh, mental health. Um, and this, this comes out of a study that was done last year by Take This, which I highly recommend you read this white paper about the state of the industry and the mental health in the industry. So there were three key factors that came out of this study that I wanted to highlight and, and discuss in this talk. So number one was the lack of job stability and the lack of longevity within this industry. And no doubt many of us have heard stories from all kinds of friends and colleagues about how they got burned burned out or they switched to a different kind of job outside of games because they either didn't get paid enough or they worked too many hours or some other reason. So this is a big issue that affects people's mental health. So you can see working conditions for game creators tend to be challenging. 
So this chart is from some of the results that came out of the IGDA Developer Satisfaction Survey. And you can see, I'm not going to read through all of these. You can study them yourself. But for example, I'll call out the one in the upper right about how, you know, 24% of people worked for three to five different employers in the last five years. That's a lot of turnover. That's a lot of shifting between jobs from one to another. Um, you know, less than half people feel that there's a clear path for advancement in the job that they have. You know, only 18% receive any kind of compensation for overtime. That's pretty scary to think about. And so the working conditions are not a secret. It's something that have been discussed very frequently in the industry. Um, and yet we don't see it getting much better. Um, you see down there in the lower right about report, 53% uh, report that crunch is often expected, which is working 60 hours or more per week. And, uh, and expected meaning that the management of their company is asking them to work those kinds of hours in order to get the game done. So the common stress points then what we hear from a lot of game developers are ones that you're probably very familiar with, like crunch and time pressures to get the game done. Um, the role of employees that we play on social media, like whether we're using our personal account or whether we're representing the company, uh, being in a very competitive workplace, um, uncertainty around job stability, and the frequent job and location changes. So all of these together, and I know people who've dealt with all of these problems in the same company company. Um, but over the course of our career, we often will deal at least with some of these problems. And these can create a lot of stress and really wear you down from a mental health perspective. So and also unfairness around certain practices that might happen in the workplace. So let's talk about crunch specifically. Um, so what's interesting is that we hear about this, these stories all the time in the game industry about how a company is asking a company to crunch. Even right now, um, you know, we're learning that Cyberpunk 2077 being created by CD Projekt Red um, is being delayed another couple of weeks or so into December. Um, but there's been already stories over the last few months about how badly they've the developers have been crunching in order to get the game done. And now we hear that it's been slipped for two weeks. And so that's concerning. That That is something that should concern all of us because even when we ask game developers if, if they think crunch is a necessary part of game development, more than half of them believe that it's not. They disagree with that statement. And there was a great project done a few years ago called the Game Outcomes Project, where they actually found that game developers that reported high rates of crunch on projects also reported a decreased return on investment and lower Metacritic scores for the games that they produced, which is crazy because that is exactly the opposite of usually why crunch is done. We're often told that we're doing crunch to make the game better and to make a better product. And yet the result of crunch is often the opposite of that because people are tired. They don't focus. They can't make good creative decisions. And so therefore the quality actually suffers. Um, there's a great white paper again at takethis.org, which I really recommend. This came out a few years ago called Crunch Hurts, and it really dives deep into the issue of crunch and why it is not a good practice um, in game development. So I highly recommend you'd look at this. Um, and so as a result of these working conditions in the workplace and the work, you know, basically the, the, what, the way that, you know, employees are being treated, it's not a surprise that over the last decade that opinions about unionizing within the game industry have actually become more positive. So you can see the, the difference here between only 32% of developers supported the idea of unionizing in 2009. And now as of last year, that's jumped all the way up to 73%. That's not a surprise when you see these kind of working conditions continue the way they have. Now, granted, there are some good stories and there's companies that are trying to change their behavior. They're trying to change the way they, they run their company, which is great. And I think more companies should do that. But the fact that unionization is being discussed should not be a surprise to anybody. Now, the second issue that's really, that's a huge impact on mental health is, and this is what developers told us in the study, is that there's a lack of diversity and inclusion in the game industry. And again, this is probably not a shock to a lot of people who've been in the game industry for even a few years. So when we ask in the, develop, in the developer satisfaction survey, do you feel there's equal opportunity and treatment for everyone in the game industry? And you can see here that the majority of people felt that 
no, there is not equal treatment and opportunity. And this has been evidenced in a lot of different ways. Again, some of those stories I showed at the beginning of the talk talk about sexist cultures and toxic cultures that exist in some game development companies. And that unfortunately still persists to this day. Um, when we also ask how important do you think, it, would you rate the following? So 75% of the developers responded that they feel that diversity in the workplace, in any workplace, is very important. But even higher, 79% felt that it's very important to the game industry. So there is support for having a diverse workplace and to have an environment that's inclusive, where everybody's ideas can be heard, where everyone has a chance to get a, you know, to, to apply for a job and will get the job, not, you know, not on the basis of, of you know, who they are, um, but actually what they can do. So everyone, they feel that's important, you know, majority of people do. However, there's a big disparity. So like in the United States, for example, we see that you know only 45%, well, about 45% of players are women. So it's almost gender parity. And we see that across many co uh, countries in the world where men and women essentially play games fairly equally. Um, but in the US, there's only 21% of the people working on the industry to make those games are women. So there's a huge gap here um, about, you know, and there's a lot of reasons for that gap, which I cannot go into at the moment, but that does create a sense of disparity and a lack of inclusion in this industry. Um, and we know from all other reports, like the the wage, the uh, Gama Sutra salary survey, which was a few years ago, um, you know, but this still remains fairly true, is that there's a gender wage gap that, that's in our industry. And I've heard all kinds of anecdotal stories from different people, like executives at different companies, who tell me that they actually did identify a gender wage gap when they actually took the opportunity to look at it seriously and see if that was the case. Because, and the reason they wanted to look at it was because because they wanted to know if they had this problem. And once they knew about it, they actually tried to fix it, which is the right thing to do. Um, but this also can be a, a point that causes a lot of stress and especially mental stress on your job. Um, the third issue is about the public perception of games. This is another problem that developers say really stresses them and has a huge impact on their mental health while they're working in the game industry. And so basically, what do we mean by this? Well, we basically mean the way games are viewed in the public is obviously by some groups in the public is not viewed as positive. Like here in the US, we constantly have this argument and it's not unique to the United States, you know, but I see this as a failure of the industry when we as video game creators, when we cannot adequately explain what video games are, and if we cannot convince people about the positive value of video games and why they are important, um, that's a failure of the industry. You know, but we see these stories all the time. And again, these stories are not unique to the United States. We see them in the UK and Germany and a lot of other companies where, or countries, excuse me, um, because there, you know, there, there's conservative factions who like to blame, they want a source of blame for problems that happen in society, and video games often get that blame, at least at the moment. Um, I do believe in time that is going to change because eventually all of these politicians who are making these decisions, every one of them will have grown up with video games. So eventually, maybe in 10 or 20 years, most of the people making these decisions and having this perception will actually understand what games are, and they'll probably have a more positive view of what games can be. Um, they're not just a negative force on society. Um, and it's interesting because like when we ever have these 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 incidents in the United States that involve gun shootings, you know, you know, and we have these horrific events that happen, um, oftentimes people will show charts like this where you show that violent gun deaths versus video game revenue. So if video games were the source of the problem, then obviously you would you should see also violent gun deaths in a lot of other countries, but that's not the case. So is the issue video games or is it the access to weapons? And you could probably figure that one out for yourself. So it, it's kind of obvious. So um, so it's a lot of us get angry that video games keep taking the blame for this kind of problem because really games are not the issue. Um, and what's interesting is that in 2011, the US Supreme Court ruled that video games are protected by the First Amendment, which is what, that's where we get our idea of free speech in the United States. So video games are protected free speech. They, you can, they are just as, 
as uh, as you can make a game and to be basically contain any kind of topic, just like a book or a movie or a television program or other things. And even the Supreme Court of the United States said that they they felt there's no compelling link between uh, violent video games and its effect on children. So, uh, and yet, even though that decision was made in 2011, a study done a few years ago showed that adults in the United States still believe that there is a relationship between games and violence. 40% of the adult population believe this. Now, you know, I, I think for a lot of people listening to this, they're probably saying, no, that doesn't surprise me because it's Americans. Yeah, we can talk about that too, and I would agree with you. But uh, uh, we'll, 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 I'll stick to the topic and not get into politics at the moment. Um, but uh, the other thing is, people saw that twenty six percent think that games are a waste of time. Sixty uh, percent believe that most people who play video games are men, which we know is not true. Um, we know, like I said before, is that in most areas of the world, that it's mostly men and women play games fairly equally. Um, and then also, twenty three percent of the people thought that video games do not promote teamwork and communication, which obviously the people who answered this survey have not played a game in the last 10 years, because most games today have a very strong aspect involving teamwork and communication. So you can see there's a disconnect in the perception, but the story being posted by governments, the stories being posted by media, the perception of, of people who, who view video games who are not video game players. And so this is a disconnect that causes a lot of stress on our mental health because this is a profession that we do on our daily lives. It's something that we love. It's our passion. And yet we, we look around and we see these stories and it causes a huge negative effect on us because we constantly feel like we're having to justify our existence as game developers, and that should not be the case. You know, one of the things I want to encourage people to think about is that games, basically, we represent the current evolution of human narrative. So all of these forms of media that I'm showing right here, these are all different forms of media that human beings have developed and used over this over the millennia to convey stories from one generation to another. And currently, video games represent the evolution of that storytelling capability with this merging of technology and, and art. And so that's what we are, and we should be very proud of that. And we should stand up and, and you know, with our back straight and be really proud of the fact that this is what we represent. The other thing that's important to keep in mind as game developers is that the revenue that we generate as an industry is phenomenal. We make more money than film and music combined. You've probably heard that, that quote many times before. Well, it's been true for over 10 years. But what's amazing is when you look at the revenue of video games, and yes, this is a this chart is three years old, but the the proportions between these are still relatively the same. So look at the amount of money that video games make, even compared to books, to hard copy books, to music, to cinema, to video. And what's really amazing, if you take every live sport in the world, including FIFA and you know American football and hockey and everything else, you put them all together and video games still make more money than all live sports combined. That's a staggering amount of revenue. And so we, again, not only are we evolving the way that humans convey story from one generation to another. We are an economic powerhouse on this planet, and we should also be embracing that. That is who we are. And I know a lot of people in the industry sometimes look at themselves as being kind of scrappy startups, you know, like the video games are just becoming like a new thing that's going to get off the ground someday. It's like, yeah, we we I love that startup mentality because I think that can be healthy. But at the same time, we as a broader industry, we have to embrace the fact that we are a mature industry that that is a massive you know business in this world um, and we have a tremendous amount of influence in this world because of what we do and what we create and we should embrace that and be proud of it and not let these stories that are happening out of politicians mouths or out of certain media affect us in a negative way there is hope 
in, and I want to end this talk on a note of hope because we hear really great stories happening out there about how companies are trying to make a difference. Companies like Big Huge Game, which has com completely publicly committed to having low or no crunch, having a high diversity working environment. Ubisoft and Certain Affinity have a no a layoff model. VUGA has a, has a very strong top-down focus throughout their entire company on mental health and wellness of all of its employees. Uh, Bungie has a huge focus on diversity and, and so on and so on. Microsoft as well, with they've radically changed their work-life balance and the way it works there. And I know because I worked at Microsoft for 13 years from 1992 to 2005, and I know it's changed dramatically compared to when I was there. And plus we have these great organizations like Take This that I've mentioned before. We've got Safe in Our World. We also have the event that just happened a couple weeks ago called TIGS, which is the International Summit on Mental Health and Games. And so all of these efforts are taking place, which are trying to make a positive difference and trying to give you as game developers a resource to go to. So I feel um, I want to make sure you under make sure you know about these resources. So I feel if you if you're feeling um, like you have a mental health impact on your work uh, or you're feeling uh, feeling that affect you in some way, I highly encourage you to go to like take this and safe in our world and look at the great resources they have. They have testimonials from developers. They've got a lot of great resources that you can leverage that'll help you not only in your own individual work and in, in, uh, in how you handle the stress, but it'll also help the workplace. So it might be something you can give to your manager or give to people in your company um, that could be really useful resources to help improve things if you're finding that the place where you work um, has these issues. And on another note, for those of you who are indie developers and you're thinking, well, this is fine for all these big companies, but it's not just about big companies and company policy. You as an indie developer, it's even more of a struggle for you because you are dealing with this as you're, you are an entrepreneur and you're also a game creator. And I know exactly what that's like as a self-employed person, that it's really challenging to find boundaries between your creativity and your ability to stop what you're doing and to take a break and to get, you know, kind of refresh your mental health. It's really important for you to be mindful of these issues. So I think it's even more critical for indie developers to think Think about these things and to set a good example for yourself and for the other people you might work with. Um, and especially because if you grow to become a bigger company, at least you'll have a good way to start. You'll know that this is a, a important from the start and you're making this a priority for all of the people who work in your company. So that is something I wanted to uh, just in the brief time I had here today, obviously this is a much bigger topic, um, but I, I more than welcome uh, some questions. Um, if we have the chance. So I really appreciate uh, your time here and uh, let's have some questions. Hello, Kate. Hello. Great, great to have you live. Thanks for the presentation and thanks for bringing up uh, some of those topics. Um, and yeah, you know, I, I realized that I have repeated some of those things myself, uh, you know, in the last few years with the, with the comparison between uh, movies and uh, games and music, and uh, you know, some uh, the, even even I got some questions today from from local media about video game violence. So mm -hmm. these are very recurrent uh, recurrent things. So let's uh, take a oh, couple yeah. of questions from the audience. Um, so crunch still exists because many employees accept it as such. What do you think? Mm -hmm. People in the industry accept crunch time because of the job security uh, or you mentioned, or because of the fact that many of them are very passionate about what they are doing? Uh, that's a great question. And I think the problem is, is if, frankly, it's both of those things. Um, we bring that passion for what we do into our job, which is great, and we should have that passion. But the problem is that companies exploit that passion. They take advantage of it because they know that game developers are passionate. So if they ask their crew to work like 12 hours or 14 hours or 16 hours a day in order to get the game done, oftentimes our passion for our job and for what, we, what we're creating 
overrides our sense of wellness and, and mental health balance and physical health and all these other things. And I think all of us have seen examples of people who took it to the extreme and it's not healthy. And, you know, like I mentioned earlier is that um, I, I think the with that report called Crunch Hurts, it outlines in there how human beings, we really can't sustain more than two weeks of crunch hours because after that, there's no return on the investment of time. And so we, you know, having these brief moments where we crunch in order to get some milestones done, if it's for a week or two, oftentimes that's okay. But beyond that, it, I mean, there's many medical studies that show that human beings, we just cannot sustain that same high level of creativity. And so I think we have a responsibility as the people doing the work to watch our own behavior and to not allow ourselves to you know fall into that trap of just letting our passion override everything because you will burn out trust me that that's why the average game developer career these days is somewhere around five to seven years which is really sad um but at the same time management they need to do better project management um you know they need to be understand that you know the, the the time that they've allotted for production of their game um i i understand all the business pressures but a lot of times crunch comes down to poor project management it's people who are in a position to make decisions and they just don't know exactly what they're doing frankly <laughs> and i've seen many examples of that firsthand from my own work Thank you. And but do you think, you know, with the with the pandemic and work from home, uh, it looks like the the lines have blurred even more between uh, you know uh, what's work and what's uh, personal life. So, how can yeah. how can companies uh, who don't even want to do crunch, uh, or you know, how do they prevent people working more than they should, uh, just because you know you're in front of your laptop or PC? Mm -hmm. all day and you know it's sometimes it's just very difficult to to keep to put a you know a, a blocker and the differentiator between the two yeah i mean that's that's a great point i think the pandemic has really made things difficult because um i mean there's a lot of people already complaining about blurring that line between work and and your life and i mean how many times have we seen all the on all the calls over the last several months uh your kids or pets or other people walking in the background and distracting us when we're trying to speak or, or have a meeting. And that's just the way it is. And I was just having this conversation yesterday with a colleague and they were concerned about, you know, they had to rearrange their house. They had to set up like a home office and have a place where they can actually do work on a regular daily basis. And the company's not compensating them for anything for, you know, they needed to get better internet. They needed to have a better desk. They needed a better camera. They needed all of these things in order to actually work from home and they weren't prepared for that. And so now they're wondering, is the company going to compensate me for this? And probably not. They probably won't. Um, but then you're right. The, the bigger problem is the fact that that same chair you're sitting in and working in is the same chair you're probably going to play some games in if you t stop working at some point. Um, and so how do you stop that? And I think that requires even greater self-discipline to, to basically set a timer or have some kind of system in place where you can just say, okay, I'm stopping now. But we all we know that's hard. So I don't know, companies are going to have to come up with ways where they basically help employees stop working, you know, if they're, if they're in a work from home environment situation. And maybe that means doing something drastic, like actually cutting off the internet access to the company so you can't access the builds or something. I don't know. Um, but that's, it's, it's a, I think it's a big problem and I'm glad you brought it up. That's important. Thank you. Um... Kate, thanks a lot for uh, for you know taking the time to do the presentation and for joining us live. Uh, I know you were also live for the Women in Games panel uh, yesterday. It's uh, mm -hmm. been a pleasure having you part of the conference, and hopefully we can do this uh, again in person at some point in the future. I hope so. I hope so. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.